Okay, thank you for being here. I am Nancy Baker Cahill. I'm a visual artist from Los Angeles. And uh, these are my fearless collaborators and app developers. Um, one of the things we just did was we went to a talk on collaboration and how important it is to share, to be aligned in your values and in your ethos. And I couldn't be more lucky to be uh, partners with people who are equally fearless and sort of innovative in their approach. So we are very, very well matched. Um, I want to make sure that you can see what I see on my computer. So I don't, it doesn't seem to be translating through the HD. Oh, okay. Hmm. I'm hooked into the HDMI. No, I have the actual presentation. It's fine if you want to run it from there. I can still do it. There, there it is. Perfect. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to talk really briefly. It's, it's an unusual thing. The realm of fine art and augmented reality is still very much in co-it. And so you might be wondering, how does a fine art sort of studio visual artist get involved in some, in the, who, who traffics in the most ancient form of mark making end up using the most futuristic technique as well? And uh, my practice has always been somewhat bifurcated. I've always had one foot in drawing and one foot in video. Uh, but in all of my work, whether I'm drawing or creating immersive video experiences or immersive installations, I'm always trying to elicit a kind of empathic response on the part of the viewer. I want you to feel the work in your body. The way that I make the work is very physical, and it's always my hope that you too will experience it that way in your body. And interestingly, um, my, my, my um, both 3D and 2D work, when I look back on it, these are two older works. They really presage the work I'm doing now. Um, the work on the left eerily presages my most recent VR drawing, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. This was a body-scaled sculpture called Decomposition, which really kind of deals with um, a dissolution and reconstitution of the body. And I had it hung from a monofilament, and it spun very, very slowly and sort of eerily in space. The same thing happens in the VR drawing, which I'll explain in a moment. The more recent drawing on the right is huge. It's about eight feet tall. And again, when, I want, when you encounter it, I want you to feel it in your body. And as with VR and in drawing in VR, I've always tried to sort of extract forms from a void, from the void of the white paper. And to that end, I want to say two things. The first is that all of this has sort of led inexorably to the most immersive medium there is, which is VR, but also that mark making is incredibly important to me. In fact, it's essential to my practice. So when I started drawing with Tilt Brush, which as many of you know is a miraculous tool, um, I found it ecstatically liberating to draw in 360, but incredibly frustrating not to be able to, to make the kind of marks that I wanted to make. And when I started working with Drive Studios with my partners here, they really allowed me to incorporate my own marks, my own visual vernacular into a larger body of work in the VR, which you'll see in a moment. So just try and sear these two images into your head for a second. And this is um, in a, a video capture of my latest piece called Strange Laugh. You probably don't recognize any of these marks. That's because they're entirely original. This piece is quote unquote narrative. Something actually happens in this piece. But critical to my VR, it's moving very fast. In, in person, it's glacially slow the way it turns. This is just to give you a sense of how it works. Um, there's, a, there's a moment in this. But I've, it's always been really, really important to me that whoever is experiencing the VR drawings is led by their own curiosity. In other words, you decide how you engage with the drawing. You decide whether you want to go into it, teleport away from it. How close do you want to get up to it? And that is, that is also, you'll, you'll see, has a lot to do with how we created the app as well. It's about choice and it's about agency in how you experience art. Um, one of the other things that really inspires me is literature and philosophy. And, um, uh, I'm a big fan of Annie Dillard, who wrote an incredible essay to artists and writers, and in it she exhorts them to know your own bone, to, to, to know what obsesses you, the thing that you have to give voice to, your own astonishment, and she urges you to gnaw on it and 
bury it and dig it up and gnaw on it again. And as you can see, I'm a little obsessed with explosions and in ruptures in space. I used to shoot my work with bullets. Then I started playing more with, again, that void of the white paper, creating a kind of ecstatic and violent rupture that is frozen in a moment in time. But I want to point out that the drawing on the lower right is the only drawing in this whole grouping that spans many years that I created after working in VR. VR has changed my neuroanatomy. It changes the way that I perceive the white sp space of the paper and represent velocity and, uh, and different types of mark making. This is the drawing in VR. Just a still from the VR. These are all my own marks. Here's another example of, in the same series, of a drawing on the left, which is pre-VR, pre-VR, and the second one post. Um, one of my great, great challenges and, and joys was when we, when with Drive, I was able to um, create a brush stroke that really, really captured that sense of, in VR, of, um, of that graphite streak and really, really make it part of that same family, that same visual vernacular I keep talking about. Um, and these, all these forms fall very slowly in space. Here's yet another example of a VR drawing, then realized after the fact in 2D. There's a creative loop that's happening, and that creative loop, one feeds the other. In other words, one doesn't lead to the other, but they're in this constant feedback loop, which has really um, changed the way I make art, fundamentally. And anyway, last thing, lest you think I only traffic in monochrome, um, I really, really love this writer Maggie Nelson, and she wrote a book that references a Gertrude Stein poem called Tender Buttons. And in Tender Buttons, she writes about hurt colors. And the idea is that if you slit open a, a color, you could reveal something essential about it, which is a totally mind-blowing concept. And I was obsessed with it. At the same time, I was reading about Civil War battlefields and looking at bodies on the ground. And I wanted to kind of fuse the two. So the painting you see on the right is a post-VR painting. That is not an image I could ever have conceived of or, or executed prior to working in VR. Here's the VR, some stills from the VR drawing. Now, this is all fabulous. Um, having a studio in Los Angeles is fabulous. Having VR experiences is fabulous. But they are very, very singular in nature. And you need access to hardware, and you need access to my studio. Um, at, around this time, we, I was super, super fortunate to be approached by um, a group called Innovation, If Innovation, whoops, sorry, uh, If Innovation Foundation, I'm trying to get this to play, sorry, that's not going to work, I don't think. Um, anyway, these were a series, oh yes I can, there we go. So, um, if you were driving down the Sunset Strip, you would see these VR video captures playing on the Jumbotron. You would probably be very confused because they were sandwiched in between ads for Ellen and Late Night with Steve Myers, but especially at night, they were extremely dramatic and extremely immersive and probably made people very, very confused and excited. At least that's my hope. We think it's the first time VR has ever been used in a public art forum like this as digital billboards. So that was, that was fantastic, but you still didn't get the full experience. And it got us really thinking about the democratizing potential of AR and how we could really explode this into a much larger, larger broader audience, hence the app. Um, this is the, the UI you can see here is, um, as one reviewer called it, aggressively non-commercial. And it too, as you can see, marries the analog, marries my hand. My hand is in every single part of this to the most futuristic uh, application. So thanks to Drive, uh, we have this wonderful fusion of, you know, this is clearly an app by, and for, by an artist, and, and each one of these top four images is a VR drawing translated into AR. We also have a, a holo, uh, excuse me, vol volumetric capture of me discussing the con conceptual underpinnings of the work and the why of the app. So please check it out. By the way, if you haven't yet downloaded the Fourth Wall app, I encourage you to. You need a success or above. We're not ready for Android yet, but we will be in version two. Um, you could also be in the middle of a street in Brooklyn and visit my studio in Los Angeles. And all you have to do is walk in through this portal or teleport. And this was something that Drive developed independently 
um, and as a part of our shared concern for differently abled people or people who are in some way constrained in their lives, whether it was through their own physical circumstance or other circumstances. In other words, regardless, you could experience this if you were standing in a closet. So that's another one, that's the teleport function right there. But the most thrilling thing, the most exciting thing about this app has been how much fun it is. And in giving people that same choice and in granting them the agency to decide where and how they experience and place art in their worlds, it has ignited their imaginations in ways that we could not have anticipated. I have, if you go on uh, Instagram, at fourth wall app for the number four, you will see the breadth of some of the, some, and, and, and this is, these are only the people who've bothered to hashtag it. People have placed these artworks all over the world. And they have the choice of either taking a picture or using a video camera. So in these th four cases I'm showing you, we've got a cathedral down in downtown LA, a Cleveland steel yard, Lake Erie, and Carnegie Hall, and there are no filters on any of these. I just want you to know that. Um, other people have placed them in the LA River, in a six-seater engine, a flight above Malawi. The Caribbean, I had some, somebody on the five train going to the Bronx used it, which was thrilling to me. Uh, we also have these kind of wonderful meta moments where um, recently at LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, we showed the VR drawings and projected them on the wall and then had people use the app at the same time, just as a kind of simulacrum or, or you know, I'm not gonna get theoretical. Anyway, here's another just really super fun Here's her colors at the Bronson Bat Caves in Los Angeles. And you can see these are all individual brush strokes, um, all of which are consistent with the rest of the work. I'm really, really excited too that people aren't just doing this aesthetically and they're not just doing it. I mean, it's, a play, it's fabulous. When someone wakes up in their bed and they want to use it, awesome. Want to do it in the bathroom? I don't care. It's fantastic. But what I really love is humor and irreverence. And this is one of my favorite videos. Somebody put Hollow Point 101 on the baggage carousel at LAX. Um, I never get tired of watching that. Another person placed it in an empty classroom in Qatar. Um, well, you can see my friend Sonia Walger gamely posing as, with it as a headdress, and another person who will rename, <laughs> remain nameless um, created an apocalyptic one in downtown LA. Um, and finally, to close out my remarks, I want to talk about content creation. Content matters, and content really matters in tech. I think we see a lot of gaming. I've been really, really careful to stay away from the language of gaming and be true to my own goals as an artist. And um, this is really, I love ending on this note because my friend Tanya Aguinigo, who is a, uh, an artist herself and does a lot of work at the U.S.-Mexico border, took the app to the border and basically set the drawing in the US and pulled it through the border wall into Mexico to underscore the idea that art is and should always be borderless. And if there's one goal of the app, it is to underscore that idea. I want it all over the world. I want everyone to have choice and agency about where and how they experience it and hopefully record it for their enjoyment and create a kind of living archive of this massive global art exhibition. So with that, I cede the floor to my incredibly talented colleagues. Justin Diener. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, my name's Justin Diener. I'm the managing partner and executive producer of Drive Studios. We too are an uh, LA-based company. And it's kind of funny for me to be here today um, as a developer because when we first founded the company, we identified ourselves as filmmakers. Now, at the time, the body of our work was more focused on commercial and music video production and post-production. For those of you that may not be familiar with those terms, it essentially is capturing content, editing it, then applying color and visual effects to finish the piece off. The reason I bring that up is because although we never formally planned on developing in the AR space, we have, in a sense, been augmenting reality from the onset. I find the most prevalent theme of our work, <clears throat> whether it be with pr production, 
VFX, VR, AR, or anything for that matter, is the ability to allow an artist to actualize their vision. Now, this is the core idea and the ethos of our company, and we find ourselves at such an inter interesting intersection of art, entertainment, and technology right now. And I think this is especially true in AR, where the best user experiences are being developed by those with an understanding and appreciation of how these things inter intertwine. We consider every member of our team as an artist, and I think that that may be why our experience with Nancy and the fourth wall was such a successful one. When Nancy first came to us, she had a vision, but sadly, at the time, there didn't seem to be the tool set that would allow her to realize it in the app space. What started as a task to optimize assets quickly grew. With Nancy, we swiftly recognized her obvious talents and her story's potential. Like I said before, we're filmmakers, and there's nothing a filmmaker loves more than a good story. Thanks to the opportunities of AR, we can not only see the art itself, but also a near photoreal room scale representation of Nancy's studio. Furthermore, we can meet the artist herself via volumetric hologram to learn about her technique and inspirations. Now this is much of our pride and joy as a company, to help nurture and grow a seed of an idea into a rich audience experience. In the case of the fourth wall, it was essential that we did this in a way that didn't compromise the integrity of the art and respected Nancy's visual language. In the end, we were thrilled with what we produce, both artistically and technologically. Our team, our process, our techniques are all something I'm very proud of. And I'm incredibly grateful to have one of my partners and our supervisor here with me to outline some of the approaches that we took in a little bit more detail. Louise Baker Lee. Hi, everyone. I'll be quick. OK. Um, first, it's just really exciting and fun to be an artist and supervisor in this new space because it's just a totally new way of thinking about how we see art and entertainment and content um, in, on sort of a personal level. Um, and we've been, we've been keeping a very close and curious eye on AR over the years, watching the software and hardware develop to the point where it's now feasible to actually generate interesting content that's accessible to large numbers of people. And because it's uncharted territory, it's really thrilling. Um, so when we began to dig into the creative aspects of building Fourth Wall, we began to realize that there are, so many, there are a lot of similarities between the work that we've done for years in visual effects and pre-visualization in the AR content uh, creation, like programs and techniques that we've been using, like photogrammetry, um, are completely relevant here. The first time I used it was on Elf, the movie, many years ago, which dates me. But um, it's a great way to capture and create realistic three-dimensional environments to scale that anybody can experience. And we've used that in a number of projects. Um, we've used DepthKit and Connects to capture artists for music videos in the past. And we're happy to discover that the core tech there works really beautifully inside AR. Um, and so we used it for Nancy's hologram. And it's just been a much more natural transition than we had ever imagined. Um, you know, our 3D software, we've gone from Maya to Unity. We are, our 2D tracking software is now sixed off camera tracking. And it's just a, a, a nice, um, lang you know, it's another step. It's not a step forward, it's a step next to what we've been doing. And with each project, we dive into the unknown and we take creative risks and learn um, what's possible in this rapidly evolving space. Um, our most recent app, m and Augmented, built upon what we had learned from Fourth Wall and then delved into image recognition and site and time-specific live AR experiences. And drawing on our knowledge of visual effects and compositing, we built larger-than-life 3D set extensions for the world tour, and GPS locked them to the stage. And we got to see it at Coachella, and it was awesome. Um, and so finally, with all our new experiences, we are really excited to get into the second version of Fourth Wall. And um, you know, we can't wait to see what we can do to showcase Nancy's work and sort of 
keep redefining public art and and seeing how we can you know use it in exciting and stimulating ways. Thank you.